Hi guys, Jonathan back once more with a not that unusual weapon to ask you the question, what is this weapon? You might think, but if you know us by now, you know that we like to throw some curveballs in there. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, on social media, we do have uh, a bit of a fun guessing game that ties into this series. You don't have to take part in that. Hopefully the episodes stand them uh, alone, um, but we think it's fun. <laughs> so there is a thing about this gun. So first of all, what's the generic type? Just in case you've been living under a rock for the past 80 years, um, <laughs> or just don't know that much about guns. The MP43 slash MP44 slash STG44. So MP standing for machine and pistola, uh, STG standing for Sturmgewehr. Now that doesn't come on the picture until 1944. There's a whole mess of complication in the middle, and this particular variant is part of that mess. So in broad concept, uh, so retrospectively, calling it the Sturmgewehr, this is the invention of the modern assault rifle, the true assault rifle, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Everything after that, including the famous Kalashnikov, follows in the mould of a short, compact, not necessarily that light, but <laughs> short and compact, um, automatic weapon, so a rifle capable of automatic fire, firing a reduced power cartridge. So this narrow looking magazine here is halfway between the very slim magazine of a, an MP40, the classic German submachine gun, and the um, very deep, very wide magazine of a full power rifle well, like the Mauser 98, uh, Car 98K, only that's buried in the, in the wooden stock. Or the uh, G G43, self-loading rifle that, that came, well, in 1943, hence the name. And that has that very broad magazine. So this, this is, becomes a sort of almost technological, ideological war going on in the 1940s between people who want to stick with full power rifle cartridges like 30 or 6 303, um, 792 by 57, the, the full power German rifle cartridge, and those who see the way forward by reducing the length of the cartridge, reducing the amount of propellant inside, and you get a much more of a, a rifle type bullet coming out at significantly high velocity, but not as high velocity, coming out of a more compact weapon for use in the assault. So there's a lot of consternation about the term assault uh, rifle these days uh, technically it's a it's a not hugely useful term but it's colloquially very popular and it it does originate from this german sturmgewehr concept a rifle that you can carry forward in the assault and use like a light machine gun like a submachine gun but it has the capability of firing somewhat accurate shots out to say 300 meters as a rifle so working back from the present almost all modern infantry rifles um, are assault rifles, and they all owe a debt to this thing. So that's the broad picture around the Sturmgewehr, originally introduced as the MP43, uh, for reasons that I will uh, come to when we wrap up. Now, of course, we haven't got just any old MP43 for you today. We have an MP43 slash one. So let me first of all show you that marking on the receiver. Uh, another, the other new concept, well, not brand new, but relatively new concept around this weapon was extensive use of sheet steel to keep down costs. Once you've tooled up to make uh, pressed or stamped steel receivers, handguards, uh, well, they were already doing it for magazines, um, but these more convoluted shapes required to, to create a whole firearm required a bit more technological know-how, but once you've done it, you can make a more cost-effective firearm. Not necessarily a lighter firearm. People think thin bits of metal are lighter than machined bits of metal, but certainly not always the case. This thing is a bit of a pig, uh, significantly heavier even than a first-generation Kalashnikov. So it's not so much about weight, it's more about cost. So MP43-1, what on earth does that mean? And why do we have MP43-1, which comes first, confusingly, then MP43, then MP44, then STG44, and then the story ends. Um, 
And there are more designations than that as well, by the way. There's MP43A, there's MP43B, and the granddaddy of this whole family is the MKB-42, which comes in two, two flavours, completely different weapons. One is the brackets W, one is the brackets H. So go away and look that up if you're interested. Uh, we won't try and get into that minefield today, except to say that the MKB-42H is the progenitor of this thing and that whole lineage that I've just outlined there. MKB being yet another period German uh, acronym or abbreviation for uh, Maschinen Karabiner, so machine carbine, which very confusingly is what the British called a submachine gun. But the Germans were using it to differentiate from MP, which was their submachine gun, to try to cover the fact that this is more of a rifle. It's more of a self-loading slash automatic rifle. So that in initial designation made quite a lot of sense. <laughs> so, and we have examples of those too, which we might surprise you with uh, another time. So returning to, to, the, to the, the main event here, what is an MP43 slash one? Well, best way to show that, uh, apart from the marking, of course, which does mark it out as different, is to put it side by side with an ordinary, although they're not that common, MP43. Let's just confirm that we, I have in fact picked the right weapon off the rack. This is an MP43, not an MP44 or an SGG44. Although, as I'm fond of saying, spoiler alert, those three are all identical. Um, <laughs> but this is actually a real MP43. So it's the direct successor to the other gun. So let's just take off the magazines, or this magazine anyway, so I can get them uh, closer together. And we'll try to show you what the differences are because these are the only members of this design family, so ignoring the MKBs, <laughs> that have any meaningful difference that's associated to their name, if that makes sense. Build standard changes happened through the development of the rifle, but the name did not change. The name did change with respect to these changes that I'm about to show you. I hope that makes sense. So working forward from the middle, because everything back here is the same apart from uh, the name. Note these or this, because I can only show you the one side at the moment, but this rib here, and the fact that there is no rib on this side. That was a sight mount for a magnified optical sight. So they were already um, early 1943, February, March 1943, looking at having the ability to fit an optical sight, which is pretty forward thinking. Um, yeah, we, we, we're already looking at uh, one, one, one rifle to rule them all kind of thing, that something that could potentially replace all the bolt-action rifles. If you had self-loading rifles, those as well, and all the submachine guns. Um, the ability to also mount an optical sight doesn't give you a sniper rifle, but it might give you a designated marksman rifle. That was the logic. So the early gun, the MP43-1, has, I'll just show you them, both sides. So you see what I mean? They have pressed out sort of triangular section ribs, both sides of the rear sight block. And there's also a little notch cut in there as well as a, as a sort of detent so that the sight won't come off. Now the, the ZF41 optical sight did make a comeback later in the development of this uh, family of weapons with a different mount on the left side of the receiver. But that's a different story and it's not tied to the changes in designations. So all of the other design changes are right at the front end of the rifle in front of the, the gas block. So that's this big chunky cast component here, uh, which contains the, the little hole that the high pressure gas is piped through to drive the, the long operating piston back and cycle the weapon. It's a fairly straightforward design. It's just pinned over the barrel, which has a little hole in it. Uh, that's not why we're here. <laughs> why we're here is firstly, the diameter of the barrel. So on the 43 slash one, it's a constant diameter or a plain diameter, just a tube. On the 43, which remember comes after the 43 to slash one, it's a two diameter 
design. They have turned down this bit of the barrel to a smaller diameter. Why? You'll see in a moment. Then we have the front sight block. So on the 43 slash one, it is wider and it's also a different design. So it, it just has a straight edge here. It doesn't have the reinforcement for the pin here. It is narrower on the 43, wider on the earlier 43 slash one. Ignore the missing front sight protector. That is just something that was easily lost. In fact, in troop trials, there were complaints of this and I don't think they ever solved it because um, I've, not managed to knock, I've nearly managed to knock one off myself previously. Um, so, you know, a, a fair, this is a heavy weapon for its size and, and a slight knock on this can displace it and cause it to pop off. So that's the reason it's missing on the 43 slash one. Not because it didn't have it. You can see the grooves where it would have fitted. So if you're trying to work out whether something is a 43 uh, slash one or not, you may not be able to see the two diameter barrel. Look for a short gap between the front of the stacking hook, um, which is what this is, this little, this little um, sticky outy bit on the front of the gas plug, which is what this is also the gas plug, is for stacking rifles together like that so they can sit in a, in a sort of cone arrangement while you go and have your, your dinner or whatever. Um, so the front, the, the uh, 43 slash one sight block, distance between that and the front of the stack, the piling um, or stacking hook is really quite short. It's less than the length of the actual hook. Whereas on the 43, it's significantly wider. The, it changes the proportions of the front of the gun. And it is essentially the same width, maybe even a little bit longer or wider than that stacking hook. So. That for me is probably gonna be the easiest recognition feature in period photos, period footage. You're gonna to struggle to spot the other features, which brings me to the final one. And then to bring all this together as to why they made these changes, it is the barrel nut or the muzzle nut. So the original design is significantly longer. It has a smooth center between the uh, wide, I should say, a wide smooth center strip between the two uh, ribbed sections that are there to get to get a grasp on to unscrew this and then the four, fully developed 43 slash 44 slash SDG 44 component is this much shorter nut concealing a shorter thread of course that has only a very thin strip between this, those two strips of ribbed metal which are themselves narrower too. Now why were all these changes made? Well easiest way to show you that is to grab the grenade launcher for the Car 98K rifle, which is a, a simple, relatively simple cup launcher, albeit it is quite deeply rifled. And this clamps onto the barrel. So it slips over and clamps onto the barrel of the Car 98K, which is what it's designed for. You can't fit it to the 43 slash one. I believe the intent was to design a whole new suite of muzzle accessories. Um, I've even seen a suggestion of a, of a suppressor that would use this attachment system and fit around this thickness of barrel. But in the event, uh, what they went with was the turned down barrel and the shorter nut. And actually I've just realized that's been set. That's what that should look like. We just put those back together briefly. There's a little spring plunger here that sits in between those uh, ribbed sections. They're not just there to get a purchase on, they are there to locate the muzzle nut and stop it from unscrewing. It's much like the muzzle device on the uh, AKM. So it's a plunger. So we press the plunger down, unscrew the nut, all the way, revealing our accessory attachment system, also known as a thread. And then we slip grenade launcher over the muzzle, flip closed the attachment at the rear and spin that up. And there you are, there is your 
MP43, not slash one. Magazine loaded with grenade cartridges, cycling it manually one, uh, one at a time, of course, loading in a grenade into the muzzle, and bloop, away you go. Those of you who know a bit about this subject will already know this same attachment system was used for the Krumlauf curved barrel attachment. So, all of that, there are two, two main aspects to this. One is the ability to fit an optical sight, which was temporarily done away with, and the other is to allow you to use the existing grenade launcher and the existing grenades, of course, from the Car 98K. Now that brings us to an interesting bit of lore slash history around this family of weapons, in that uh, one of the running arguments amongst the various organizations and personalities involved, including Adolf Hitler, was whether this thing should replace all the rifles and SMGs in a platoon, say, um, and be a jack of all trades, or whether it was basically a glorified submachine gun that had greater range, accuracy, terminal effect, all of that. And that exact same argument was repeated in the Soviet Union years later when the SKS was introduced as the standard, uh, albeit reduced power cartridge carbine, and the AK was going to be essentially a, um, an SMG on steroids, and then they soon realized that actually the AK does it all. Let's, let's focus on that. Well, same thing was happening in 1943 and was one of um, Hitler's apparent reservations over actually ordering this thing into production. And sources' uh, opinions vary on this. Um, there's the, uh, the very good book, um, Sturmgewehr by Hans-Dieter Handrich, who details three separate occasions when Hitler cancelled the uh, MKB 42 slash MP 43 slash one. Uh, so the last of those is in February 43, and then it, but then by March, end of March 43, he has perhaps reluctantly allowed the 43 slash one into limited production, special production, to sort of keep that ticking along. But he has supposedly also cancelled any further development. He's, he's focusing on rifles in existing production, and for the future, his, uh, he seems to be favouring the M uh, G43 full-power self-loading rifle. That, that's the, the, the sort of received wisdom. Um, uh, Lesek uh, Ehrenfeicht, forgive my pronunciation of your name, um, challenges that and suggests uh, Hitler was, was not cancelling this thing per se, um, that he was concerned with introducing it piecemeal. He wanted to sort of save it up until it was A, finished, and B, they could ramp it up into full production and, and start replacing other weapons. And then there's this question of what's it going to replace? Is it only going to replace submachine guns? Is it only going to replace weapons in certain units, as the, as the Soviets were starting to do, giving a, a whole platoon, uh, Papasha? 41 submachine guns, for example. And in the event, cutting out all the, all the uh, controversy over, over who said what and whether Hitler really did hate this thing, I'll leave that to, to other um, colleagues to, to argue about. Um, he did, uh, well, firstly, reluctantly order this into limited production. Then by 44, he relented and decided that this thing should enter mass production. He even coined the name Sturmgewehr. That, as far as I can tell, is absolutely true. Um, so the modern term assault rifle was invented by Adolf Hitler. Do with that information what you will. But in actual issue, it did go only to particular units uh, in 1944. Uh, the Nazis never quite got to the point of replacing the weapons that this can do the job of. And later history has shown that it absolutely could have done the job of all submachine guns and all rifles other than designated marksman rifles and sniper rifles. Um, it couldn't really replace the light machine gun. It, the, the intermediate cartridge isn't really powerful enough for that. Although the Russians did, or the Soviets, I should say, did sort of um, show that you, you can at least have a go with things like the uh, RPK. So that, that's kind of up for debate. But the, the Germans, uh, the wartime Germans, the Nazi government, did not fully exploit the capability of this weapon. There wasn't really time. By the time this thing was ready to go, uh, the tide was turning, and they really should probably have been focusing on existing production. They shouldn't probably have uh, bothered to go down this route as far as they did, um, or down the route of the G43 as far as they did. Um, the Brits stuck with a bolt-action rifle all the way through the war, 
and it was the Allies that won. So it all gets a bit complicated. I'll leave that to the military historians. But hopefully you found this interesting. So just for absolute clarity, MP MP43 slash 1 has these features. And that's the only difference between that and the whole rest of the family. The MP43 in front of me is identical to the MP44, is identical to the SGG44. And there's one final little footnote here, which is that the story of this rifle did not end in 1945 with Allied victory. Um, East Germany initially made uh, limited use of the SGG. Uh, the former Yugoslavia ended up with quite a few of them and used them for a while. And then somehow they keep cropping up. So there was, um, I helped to document some of the material in Ukraine in the initial Russian invasion in 2014. And there was an SGG or two there. Um, in Syria a few years ago, crates of these things showed up, pristine, presumably with ammunition, and they were even used for a while. I saw one of them adapted into a remote weapon station with a camera and a mount, absolutely bizarre. But of course, once the ammunition runs out, you, you're just gonna fall back on AKs and, and other modern self-loading and automatic rifles. But this thing isn't quite dead yet. They're still out there, they're still being used in anger. And it speaks to the design genius, really, of this basic design. Um, yes, it's a bit heavy for a modern assault rifle. Yes, it doesn't have the modern accessory capabilities, but hey, early on, it had more than the AK did later on. So. Yes, this is still a capable combat rifle in theory, albeit technology has surpassed it. So the, the, the other interesting thing about this family is they're not last ditch weapons in the same way that um, the simplified Mauser rifles, the Volkssturm rifles that, that you'll have seen are, um, but they are getting on toward the Sten as a semi last ditch design, as in resources are already tight, uh, and quality control, as, as getting into 1945, especially as um, the Germans try to keep production going, you can almost see it. If you lined up enough of these things in a row, you'd see uh, well mismatched assemblies made in different places and finished in different ways. That's something you'll see if you look at the books. Um, and just quality of individual components. Uh, breech blocks tend to crack. Um, we, we've experienced that, and we know other collectors that have as well that they would keep on trucking for, for probably thousands of rounds without causing any major problem. We're not in the business of, of doing that, um, but you might have been in 1945. And of course, so, so you, you, you start out with a design that's relatively cheap and, and quick and easy to produce, and then you see build standard changes that we won't go into here, but um, that make things cheaper and simpler over time. The butt stock changes shape and becomes easier to make, for example. And then you see the actual quality um, go through the floor as well. You see this with all weapons on the losing side in a major conflict, as they're having to still keep making them. Um, so amazing how you can read history through these, uh, these artifacts. So if you'd like to read more, uh, the Hans Dieter Handrich uh, collector grade book that I mentioned is really quite comprehensive, well worth a look. And for a more sort of uh, coffee table, um, pretty book, uh, the Vickers Guide, uh, World War II Germany Volume 2 covers these, amongst other things, like the FG42, if I remember rightly. And funnily enough, their front cover is a lovingly taken, beautiful photo of this very workmanlike um, wartime gun. And it's this very exact same front bit of the MP43-1, uh, which is an indicator of its rarity and its importance in this very narrow area. As always, thank you very much for watching this episode of What Is This Weapon? We are a charitable organization here at the museum, as I'm sure you know. So we very much appreciate um, any donations that you might like to send our way. Um, link in the description as to how to do that. Um, otherwise, of course, we're, we're very happy that you, that you watch us here on YouTube. Um, you can also check out um, the GameSpot channel where, where we make regular appearances as well. And our various social media outlets, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you're welcome to check out all of those as well. In any case, we'll see you again next time.